Hello, welcome to the first Amada interview over CRISPR and cell therapies. My name is Sophia Mai, and I'm joined today by Professor Hilton. To begin, could you please introduce yourself and what you specialize in? Yes, uh, first, thank you, Sophia, for the opportunity today. Uh, this is a really great forum, and I'm really excited to be here, and I'm also very grateful to you for reaching out and making this possible. So my name is Isaac Hilton. I'm an assistant professor of bioengineering at uh, Rice University here in Houston, Texas. And my lab works on understanding how the basic mechanisms of human cells work so that in the longer term, we can actually control these mechanisms to make cells better as genetic medicines uh, and cell therapies. Thank you. To begin, I wanted to ask what your definition of CRISPR was or a possible analogy to explain how CRISPR works to someone without any previous knowledge. That's a great question. Um, so really what CRISPR is, is a an immune system for bacteria and other prokaryotes called archaea. Uh, and so what this allows these, you know, microbes to do is basically target uh, foreign uh, pieces of DNA. Uh, and so they use these CRISPR, CRISPR systems to basically seek and destroy um, DNA that doesn't match their genomes. So they can recognize the difference between foreign DNA that comes in viruses that can infect bacteria uh, and their own DNA. And when they find that foreign DNA, they chew it up and they chop it up and they do that in sort of a sort of like a scissor based mechanism. They cut up the invading DNA. Uh, and so they're always on the these CRISPR systems in bacteria are always surveilling, looking for foreign DNA to cut up to protect the bacteria that get infected. Now, what engineers have done, bioengineers and other synthetic biologists have done is basically repurpose that system for use in mammalian cells. And, you know, there's not a really, there's not a great analogy other than um, these technologies are essentially um, ways that we can, in human cells, you know, instead of recognizing foreign DNA, which we sometimes do, um, but we can use these systems to fix uh DNA that's hazardous or dangerous to human cells or human beings. And so, you know, when you think about the bacterial uh, immune system, it's to protect the bacteria from invading pathogens like viruses, just like us, uh, bacteria can get infected by viruses. Um, but in the sort of human cells and the engineered versions of the CRISPR-Cas systems, we can use these technologies to basically target DNA that uh, we want to fix or we want to change to make the cells do a particular function or to correct a disease. And there's some other um, sort of um, more nuanced uses of the tools to really control how genes are turned on and off too. And those have in human cells and those have applications for sort of cell circuits, controlling better gene therapies uh, and having cells perform functions that they might not naturally be able to do. Um, what are some of your biggest concerns about gene editing and cell therapies? So this is a great question. Um, and I think it's, you know, there are three things I would say about this. The first is knowledge is power. And so we have to get the everyone able to understand how these tools work. And that's actually why I'm so uh, excited for these types of uh, opportunities that uh, young, talented, smart people like you are creating because this allows us to start to communicate and have a dialogue with the public. Because if the public understands these technologies, they're gonna be more, um, at first that just raises awareness uh, and creates more opportunities and helps create a better informed public on the importance of science and the importance of how science can actually improve uh, human life and the human condition. And so I think educating the public on how these technologies work is really important. And so that's one of my biggest concerns. The second concern for CRISPR technologies and cell therapies is I think we need to be continually interested and motivated to make these things as safe uh, and effective as possible. And so safety is a high priority. So the, those, just to recap those two, knowledge to the public uh, and safety in patients. And so that those are both huge concerns. And the third concern is just as important and that is as these medicines sort of progress to, you know, pass the clinic, clinical trials and actually into the, um, you know, into the clinical space uh, proper, we want to make sure that they're equitable. You don't want to have a therapy that can only be used by people who, you know, have the money to, to access them. 
I think it's very important that we make sure that all of these technologies and the medicines that are created from them are available to everybody. And so the three things are increasing public knowledge, making sure these things are safe and effective, and making sure that everybody has equal access to the technologies. Thank you. Um, being such an innovation, what difficulties do you face when discovering ways for CRISPR to, to be used or developing a stronger understanding of cell therapies? It's another great question. Um, so I think the first thing is the to do science well, you have to work hard and you have to also, it's costly and it has a fiscal cost. And, you know, we as researchers in the biomedical space, in the bioengineering space, we rely on um, the public uh, or the public to support science because we go to the government for many of our funding. Um, and so that funding is very competitive uh, and it's, um, uh, you know, it takes a lot of time to secure funding uh, and we work hard to do so. And we want to make sure that, you know, we're doing science right and that is costly. And so one of the difficulties, if you can call it that, is that we really need the public to support science better. And so this is basically my pitch to say, get out there and vote for the public and, you know, vote for science because so we, we need as researchers the public to help us enable science. The more public support we can get, the more science we can do, and the better we can make our world for everybody. Um, and the second challenge um, that we face is a little more technical. And that is, so, so the first is a little bit more enabling from the uh, cost side. Um, and the second is more technical in the sense that we always, at, at current levels, we really need to sort of make sure that the tools are working as we expect every single time. And that kind of goes back to point one, mm -hmm. you know, how do we make sure that these tools are safe and effective? And so when we think about that, it's in the space or in the context of what's the best technology for a particular application or indication, and how do we make sure that it's going to be robust across all conditions that that technology might encounter? What do you find most rewarding about doing research and what drew you to doing studies in this field? So I'll start with what um, makes it as rewarding for me. So, um, you know, I love the idea of knowledge for knowledge's sake. And there's so many discoveries in this field yet to be uh, made. And so in my lab and, and on my team, we're really interested in making these discoveries but we want to do we want to do so in the sense that we can help the world and we can help people have better lives and we can help people have you know more equitable lives so that everyone can be healthier and ideally happier um, and not have to and be able to spend time on things other than worrying about their health. Now we also love the idea of um, or I do anyways and almost everyone on my team I think if you were to ask them would would echo this is that I sort of think of science as being like a science detective. So, you know, oftentimes there, the, there are these really interesting puzzles to solve in the cell and in cell therapy and in the CRISPR and the in sort of the biotechnological development er, arena. And so we love sort of designing experiments to really correctly understand and solve those puzzles. And so we have a lot of fun doing that, but we also use that to make these therapeutics in the longer term better. The third thing I'll say is this is such a great opportunity and it's sort of my dream job because the other thing that I get to do that is so meaningful for me is that I get to one, engage with young, smart people like you, um, but also I have the opportunity to train the next generation of scientists. And, you know, from my perspective, I want them to be the best in the world. And I also see that as a force multiplier because that allows me to basically, you know, help the world even beyond my time, right, on this planet. So I can hopefully train people to be the best they can be and then go, they can go train others and they can go make their own discoveries. And so it becomes sort of like this amplification of knowledge and um, opportunity and discovery uh, for the world. And what drew me to this is that, you know, I always loved science, even from a youngster. Um, and I've also just l always loved the sort of search for the truth. And really, the truth is always in the data. It's just how you interpret it and how you communicate it is um, where you constantly need to be refining uh, your expertise.
Finally, uh, what advice do you have for aspiring scientists seeking to go deeper into gene editing or molecular biology? That's a really good question. So my advice is, uh, you know, it's a good rule, good rule for everyone. Be nice. Uh, try to um, understand where other people are coming from. Uh, and two is be proactive. The information is oftentimes, at least the foundational information is oftentimes out there. And so this is why when we, this is why as scientists, we publish papers and, you know, publish comes from, you know, pub meaning public, that data should be communicated to the masses and it should be available at least in a distilled format uh, to everybody. And so if you think about being proactive and learning about uh, gene editing in this case, um, to the extent that the information is out there, constantly be learning and constantly be thinking about, you know, where are the bottlenecks? Um, because those bottlenecks are where solutions are needed. Um, but more importantly, <clears throat> the proactivity in the context of proactivity, being developing that independence, the functional independence of being able to, to search out the literature and search out the information will really uh, help anyone uh, become an expert quickly, more quickly than they would without that sort of um, uh, dive into the publicly available information. Um, and, and also the final thing is doing exactly what you're doing, reaching out to people because, you know, almost every uh, professor and academic that I know is happy to talk with folks like you and, and make sure that um, we're doing our best to uh, encourage the next generation of smart people to come along and fill these roles to, to keep this sort of force amplification of knowledge and new discoveries and new therapies um, uh, alive. That's all I have for you today. Um, thank you so much for your time and responses. It was great talking to you about CRISPR and I hope people found value in this interview. Me too. Well, thank you, Sophia, and it's been my pleasure. And again, um, I really appreciate you reaching out and let's stay in touch in the future. If you ever need anything or want to talk more, just please feel free to reach out, okay? Yeah. Thank you again, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. You too. Bye-bye.